and thank you for attending. I'm Tony Siegel, the Senior Conservator of Objects and Sculpture at the Harvard Art Museums. And between 1995 and 1998, I was a special projects conservator at Sardis, returning in 2015 as the supervising conservator. And uh, Sardis is the place where between 1995 and 1998, a young conservator from the Harvard Art Museum's Objects and Sculpture Lab was given the chance to learn his chops as an archeological conservator, and in particular, working on ceramics. Field conservation on site is very different from conservation in a museum lab. And I'd like to tell you about it and show you a few noteworthy treatments a Lydian Libes with lions and other creatures, and a Hellenistic black glaze amphora. Uh, this, this talk will hopefully suggest some of the pleasures and challenges of working in the field. So generally, after uh, the finds are discovered, the drafts person, Kathy Alexander, draws the finds in situ and photos are taken. After transportation to the compound, we would clean the shirts to reveal their character. The daily finds are processed as were described in the previous video. My situation was somewhat different. In 1996, I was brought to Sardis as a special projects conservator who was tasked with sorting and reconstructing finds from several previous seasons. Here you see the House of Bronzes ceramics that had not yet been processed. When I was shown the 20 odd heavy bags and boxes of sherds, I thought it was some kind of an initiation joke. If you like putting puzzles together, this is the world's most fabulous puzzle in three dimensions. Together, the supervising conservator, Stephen Koob, and I put together almost 60 complete or partial vessels that first season. I learned more from Steve than from anyone else in my career during those summers. We remain close friends and colleagues. The fragmentary vessels, I'll show you first. The Lydian level from which these sherds came from dated to 546 BC when Cyrus of Persia sacked Sardis. Often after being smashed and then burned, the sherds from the same vessel took on a different coloration, greatly complicating their sorting and assembly. Others, such as this beautiful, very tiny, thin-walled Lydian skiffos, are also darkened by fire and could only be reassembled as groups of sherds due to uh, missing material. One of my very favorites was this fragmentary, fire-damaged Lydian vessel decorated with animals and flowers. In order to assemble it, I had to prop up floating or non-attached sherds temporarily with sheets of plasticine, a non-drying clay, in order to create several bridging or what we call structural fills with which to reassemble the vessel. And here it is after treatment. Even on an extremely fragmentary vessel such as this, reconstructing as much of a full profile as possible is important to allow the expedition's draftsperson to complete an accurate measured drawing of the vessel. This is one of many Lydian skiffoi for which we found, cleaned, and assembled the sherds. Here you see them laid out in a typical assembly pattern. Here's an after-treatment photo in quite a handsome setting. Some of the vessels excavated in the past, such as this cookware pot, restored in the 1950s or 60s, have restorations that do not pass muster when judged by today's standards. Aesthetics aside, they were often assembled using suspect adhesives that are now unstable. When more important vessels are needed for exhibition or publication in the present day, they may require retreatment. During several of my seasons at Sardis, I was tasked to retreat several of these important vessels that were originally excavated and treated in the past. These were exhibited in the local archaeological museum in Manisa, not far from Sardis, which is the repository for finds select selected each season by the Turkish authorities. Note the large raw 
plaster fill and the surfaces of the vessel itself, which are discolored by a greenish burial accretion. It had been assembled with an unsuitable PVA or polyvinyl acetate adhesive, which is essentially Elmer's glue. After soaking in water and solvents, the adhesive has turned white, you can see on the edges here, and the adhesive residues uh, have become soft and jelly-like, allowing the lebes, which is the vessel shape, to be disassembled and the adhesive residues removed. Careful cleaning of the surface allowed the greenish skin of burial accretion to be removed, allowing the bright, brilliant colors of the vessel to be seen again for the first time. Creating such massive plaster fills in the field is extremely difficult. And here, I have saved the old fill and I'm recarving it and reshaping it to be reused. At this stage, I've adapted and incorporated the early fill using additional plaster where needed. And I've reassembled it to the uh, Levy's body using a stable, easily reversible acrylic adhesive called Paraloid B72, the same adhesive that we regularly use here in the museum. Two thirds of the vessel's original rim, which you can see here, is missing. And just within, I've created a plasticine and cardboard scaffolding, if you will, which is propped up using these bamboo skewers. And onto the scaffolding, I'll create the mold for the new rim. These little divots are keys that I cut in the plaster to receive new plaster and create a mechanical bond. At left, I've created that mold. Here's the outside mold and the interior mold. And on the right, I'm pouring the plaster to fill the mold. Uh, much can go wrong at this stage. If the mold was not properly sealed and leaked, I would have wound up with a Liebes full of wet plaster. Peeling off the mold when the plaster had set was extremely satisfying. It only remained to dress the surface with scalpel and files and fill a few small voids. This is the Liebes before in painting, but after reconstruction and filling. The plaster has been leveled, smoothed by sanding, and it's been consolidated with a dilute form of the same B72 acrylic resin. This seals and stabilizes the plaster and provides a suitable base for the paint. Here I'm applying the red tone to complete the line of the rim. And I'll also impaint the warm body tone in the background, the buff slip color. And I'll also continue the register lines across the fill. In keeping with a strict archaeological practice, no effort will be made to recreate missing animal and other decoration. Some of my happiest and most productive days as a conservator were spent at Sardis working on these spectacular vessels in an equally spectacular setting with such wonderful colleagues. And now I'll talk about a Hellenistic black glaze amphora. This amphora had also been restored upon original excavation in 1959. It has handles that are molded in the shape of satyrs, and there are a pair of head or mask shaped spouts lower down. You can just barely see there. It was covered with a heavy, obscuring brown burial accretion, and there were many losses in the neck, the body, and the foot. Most of the foot, in, in fact, was missing. Uh, the restoration was of poor quality, had not aged well, and was now unstable. I was asked to retreat it in preparation for photography for the volume of Hellenistic pottery from Sardis, which was published in 2003. Here's a few more details of the filling and in painting. Again, the quality just was not adequate. So here again, the vessel could be disassembled in water and cleaned. You can see just a little adhesive residue still clinging to the break edges. All of that must be removed 
to uh, properly re reconstruct. The mud brown burial accretions at this point were removed with a dilute organic acid with repeated rinses of deionized water and pH testing until the pH of the uh, rinse water was neutral. Here's the shirt group laid out in its reconstruction sequence. I started with the foot. Fortunately, though little remained, seen here, to allow a full profile to be recreated. And I placed the shirt on a plasticine shape I made to model the inside of the foot. I added a heap of plaster over this insert within the mold. And as it cured, I refined the shape with spatulas and scalpels. At this stage, I've reconstructed everything that I could, attached the foot, and filled the smaller losses in the neck and the body. I temporarily joined the two halves together with tape and pondered my next step. I resorted to a trick I'd heard of but never attempted, and that is inserting a party balloon and inflating it to just the right pressure to provide a suitable backing upon which to model the extensive plaster fills. I decided to do it in stages using plasticine strips, one of them is right here, to make temporary walls to keep the plaster from running down the sides. You may have noticed that the color of the balloon has changed from blue to orange. Unexpected popping is one of the hazards of this technique. The next stage, illustrated on another attic vessel in our collection, is simply to carve, shape, and then smooth the plaster fill. Here, that is seen midway through the process in a faceted, carved, roughing out stage. At this point, I've completed and sealed the plaster fills, and I've carried over the incised register lines of the original onto the fills using needle files. This helps break up the abstract continent-like plaster shapes. Note that I was able to make a mold of the missing satyr head from the intact handle on this side in order to restore this loss accurately. Here you see it in detail. These uh, handles were originally made from the same mold. And here towards the bottom, one of the two spout masks was missing. So I made a mold of the existing one and recreated it at the loss area. And here you can see after in-painting. And again, an after treatment photo, after in-painting of the amphora, now stabled, restored, and exhibitable. Uh, finally, Greeny, the legendary late Sardis director Crawford Greenwald Jr. was absolutely thrilled at the result and insisted on testing out the two mask face spouts. I was relieved that the B-72 joining adhesive was water resistant enough to allow it. It was a great pleasure to spend those summers at Sardis in the 1990s and to return in 2015 as supervising conservator. Thanks for listening. So we're in the synagogue now, which is part of our ongoing site conservation and preservation program. And this goes back to the earliest days of the expedition uh, in the 1960s, when the excavation and restoration of this building was one of the first such large-scale projects in Turkey. And the engineer in charge of most of this was Teoman Yalçinkaya, who was, um, uh, who's been here ever since. So the in 70s, early 70s, like 71, 1971, 72, uh, the mosaics which were lifted by Larry Majewski from New York uh, 
conservation center uh, was casted into concrete by us and we set them back into their original places. What they did is they lifted the mosaic, cleaned it, and uh, then we put a formwork behind it. Uh, they put the mosaics upside down with the, on the cloth which they lifted, and we put a formwork on it, and then put some mesh uh, over it and cast it in six centimeter concrete. So it is easier to carry and set them back into their places and therefore people can walk on it safely without damaging the mosaics. So that was 50 years ago and the buildings weathered reasonably well since then, weathered very well since then, but it has weathered and one of the problems, one of the ongoing problems with this is that little cracks in the mosaics uh, let water in uh, the water rusts that, con that steel mesh inside the, inside the concrete and uh, that rusts and expands and cracks the mosaics. And this is sort of an ongoing problem that we've been dealing with bit by bit over many years. Um, really the only way to stop this process of decay is to build a roof over the building. And for the last 10 years or so, a group of architects and conservators has been designing this and this summer, finally, it's coming to fruition. And if you look at the uh, atop those walls there, you will see that the um, that they've cast huge concrete grade beams that will support next week a steel structure, that, a lightweight steel structure that will um, uh, that will then have a, a canvas or a, a special uh, cloth. Uh, roof over it in a design uh, uh, made by Troy Thompson of Smith Group in Washington, D.C. So the, uh, these concretes which you see are continuous foundation beams, which the uh, seal construction of the roof truss is going to be put on top of the columns, uh, raising from those beams, but these columns are set, I mean the concrete slabs are, the slab is set on the walls which were uh, made in early 70s uh, by, uh, on the ancient walls and uh, there is a sort of a buffer zone between the ancient walls and the concrete which is casted on top of it. And you can see that very clearly here, that this part of the building is ancient, but all of this up here is modern, uh, mo modern material, which Taylon uh, built in the 1960s and 1970s. And then the concrete beam does not sit anywhere on the ancient material, but only on two, three, four meters of, um, of, of modern masonry. So on the other hand, in order to match the the uh, the concrete part uh, to the ancient walls, we are going to build uh, another layer of uh, stones and brick walls parallel to what we have done before in front of the concrete slab slabs rather so to hide them and give an aesthetical view of the ancient form. So therefore we are preparing ashland blocks which you can see a little later uh, from the Eskishair stones which we used in 70s, such stones which we used in 70s once this roof is built, then we're just beginning a sort of second stage of this project, which would be to restore and sort of revive the original mosaics, uh, working on most, not on the originals, but on places where they were filled in um, with concrete in the 1960s. And you can see in various, in lots of places where 
when the concrete was, when the mosaics were, were originally backed, little bits of concrete sort of flowed through and covered tessery, or where the borders here, um, or the, the fills rather obscure the original tessery. And uh, by addressing those over a period of five or 10 years, we can make these mosaics, um, we can restore them to, a, to more like they looked originally before they were lifted and, and how they looked in antiquity. So you can see here that the, uh, in the 1970s, they restored, uh, as an example, the, the type of interior wall, wall decoration that this building would have had with beautiful patterned colored marble, uh, pilasters with capitals, and finally at the top, there's a, a, a dedicatory inscription or a, a, an inscription uh, recording the gift of this panel of wall decoration by one of the uh, one of the people who worshipped in this synagogue. So all of that is modern restoration, as is the brick and uh, stone wall behind it that, it that the that it covers. And then on top, you can see the um, you can see the the new concrete grade beam that will hold the the roofing on it. But we don't want that ugly concrete grade beam to be uh, to be visible in the end. And so this is where we're uh, where we're constructing this shell of masonry using the same Eski Shahir stone that was left over from the 1970s. I can show you this model. The new part we did is about this level. You can see the difference also at the same time. And you can see the original parts are down below, you see. The, the rest are made in 1970s. And here also on this wall, you can see you can see the old original walls being what you call the uh, stone masonry and the brick what you call arches, etc. Up to this level, and above this is all done in 1970s. So the above part will be shelved like the other wall also. So no, the uh, vision of all the walls will be like as it was in before. And you can see the team of women who have been responsible for much of the cleaning and, and, uh, and, and fine work in this building who are now cleaning out some of the, um, some of the drains that have served to drain rainwater out of the building. And they're going to be, we hope, responsible for the further work on the mosaics. Um, this is the same team that cleaned the, uh, the Artemis Temple between 2014 and 2018. And they've been doing phenomenal work for us uh, throughout the whole program of site conservation here. Hi. The Temple of Artemis. Um, uh, we're here to show you um, the temple that has uh, just been cleaned over the past uh, five, six, seven years. Um, Hiroko, Karia, and myself have designed a, um, a, a method that um, allowed us to remove the biofilm uh, from the temple. Um, as you can see on the top, um, we left a small um, area of what the temple looked like with the sort of black cyanobacteria, moss, uh, lichen. It was, it's a whole family of organisms. And um, so we decided because, and not for aesthetics, aesthetic reasons, um, to clean the temple, but really primarily um, to save the temple, which was black, and people were using it almost like a chalkboard. Uh, mm -hmm. scratching their name into it so as a, the, the white marble would come through uh, uh, when, they, when they would scratch through the surface. So we wanted to remove that. We put signs up to asking people not to, mm -hmm. not to um, do that, put graffiti in the temple, but it never really worked. And so we decided that um, it would be best for the temple and for the marble um, to have this, uh, to have it clean. And we uh, used um, an army of women from the village 
uh, to um, apply the biocide um, and use, um, I mean, the method was a slightly different. We chose to use a, a lower concentration, but the duration of that, um, uh, the, the biocide would be over five days. So it was a really a time allowing the biocide to just sit in the stone and sort of get into the interstices of the, of the marble. And uh, that seemed to work. We didn't wash it off. We just sort of uncovered it um, and allowed the rain to wash all the, the dead biofilm away. So what you see right now is is in essence uh, all um, the hard work of the local people who have uh, done all this. It's a huge project, um, but it's um, but I think really successful in many ways. I mean, Morocco, you might want to say something. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, before we started the project, Michael uh, tested on one piece with this chemical and he got really good result. So we planned this huge project of cleaning the entire temple, and we recruited the local female work workmen. And um, that was the first time for this uh, team to employ female workmen. We have a lot of male workmen, but this was the first time to employ the female people, female Workman, and that was really successful. They did a lot of delicate work, no scratching the marble surface. They also created their own tools because we didn't want to want them to use metal tools, something gentle. So they actually carved their own, put them branches, and uh, that was very successful. And we started with a team of five. Maybe two teams of five. First we, we train by one team of five and then we just keep expanding the teams and now we have about 50 people. Yeah. At the end of five year project we had like five, three teams so that was very successful. Yeah. It changed all the dynamics of work kind of dynamics here. Yeah, I mean, I would just, I would just add that you know we look at the temple as clean, but there's a block field. There are block fields around the temple that we felt responsible to clean too, and so the project became a little bit bigger than the temple, um, as you can see by the column drawings over here and the block field off to the to the west. Uh, probably hard to see from here, but. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of stone uh, <laughs> separate from the temple. So. Very hot. Here is, here is a one of the group who is cleaning the temple marble. Uh, we didn't clean previously, so um, this is a three uh, female uh, worker. Uh, this is Ketsuban and Hatice and Minel. And they, these three are uh, one team, three of, team of five. And they've been doing this so many years, so they are so used to this. Um, this is the second day of five day process. So um, <laughs> yesterday we just wet it with straight water to soften the lichen and the other dirt, compact dirt. So today they are picking manually with this uh, handmade um, wooden tool which doesn't uh, scratch the surface. And before we started five year pro this project, uh, we tested all kinds of tools, metal tools and wooden tools, brushes, harsh brush, and made sure nothing scratched the marble surface, especially these uh, polished marble surface, because it's going to be uh, um, very visible and problematic to damage the original stone. Um, maybe you can explain? <laughs> the process. Mm -hmm. Then Hatija 
e, 9 sene, 8 ya da 9 yıl oluyor bu işe başlayalı. E, patronlarımıza, sizlere, hepinize teşekkür ederiz. Bize bu imkanı sunduğunuz için. E, i̇lk yıl Hiroka Hanım'ın sayesinde öğrendik. E, o bize şu şöyle olacak, bu böyle açın, kapatın gibi şeyler e, söyleyerek gösterdi bize. Daha sonra kendimiz öğrendik. E, açıp e, ilaç su yardımıyla, ilk önce suyla ıslıyoruz, fırçayla temizliyoruz böyle. Daha sonra ilaçla, ilaçlıyoruz, e, çullarla kapatıyoruz naylon. E, bu işlemi beş gün gerçekleştiriyoruz işte. E, daha sonra da e, şey açıyoruz beş günün ardından. Gerisini de güneş yardımıyla beyazlıyor. Böyle. İşte nasıl diyeyim? Bitirdik sayılır yani bayağı bir son bitirdik. Taşlar. Son son dokunuşlar, son taşlarımız güzeldi. Teşekkür ederiz. De. Çok çok teşekkür ederiz bize bu imkanı sunduğunuz için gerçekten. Hani ne diyecek bir şey bulamıyorum. Birazcık sen de konuş. Güzeldi. Malzemelerimiz. Hadi malzemeyi tanıdık. Malzemelerimiz. Çamak yardım ya. Evet. Çay. Böyle mantarları. Mantarları bunlarla temizliyoruz. Taşların girmediği yere diş fırçası. Daha sonra bu fırçayla temizliğimde devam edin. This process is the most time consuming of five days process. Uh, once we finish this process, we can keep uh, keep uh, uh, rinsing and put some more biocide and keep it wet. But then they can move to another section. So the process keeps going and they keep really good track of what which stage is what section. So they we thank all of you to do this work. It's really the work. Biz teşekkür ederiz. <gülüyor> teşekkür teşekkür ederiz. ederiz. Çok sağ olun. Çok sağ olun. Çok sağ olun. <gülüyor> Çok This is the work site of the, um, the church and it's a part of the, the, the temple of Artemis. Uh, right now, um, one of our uh, female um, work person as a bench and uh, this is Ramazan who does a lot of masonry work and they are pointing uh, the wall, the brick and stone walls that was um, the um, mortar was eaten by um, the bee, mason bee? Mason mortar bee, bee, yeah. That, that attacks um, soft mortar and uh, we keep losing the mortar and the structure, it eventually affects the structure. So they are using uh, the mortar without cement <laughs> and uh, pointing all the walls, cleaning all the uh, rubble and uh, Okay, welcome to the sector MMS North. This is the Lydian gate to the city and you see this limestone wall and here the conservation team is working on Lydian sandstone wall which is now it's showing the creation and this has a rare example of um, Lydian uh, inscription on the sandstone so it's important to preserve it and here is Hela, a Turkish conservator. She is working um, on the sandstone that is delaminating, probably from the salt and rain. Um, she's using a mortar to stabilize that delamination so that's not going to flake off, flakes off.
Merhaba, ön temizliğini yaptığımız taşları e, harçla sağlamlaştırma işlemi yapıyoruz şu an. Hello, welcome to the conservation lab uh, here at Sardis. Uh, so this is the laboratory space uh, that we work in. Um, it's connected to the rest of the depot compounds. Um, so this is where, once all finds have uh, come in from the field and they've been registered by the recorder, uh, they come in to our inbox over here. And um, part of what we're doing here is uh, cleaning objects, removing soil, um, sometimes removing burial accretions to, to clarify and understand what the objects are. Um, part of what we're doing is stabilizing. So for objects that are very fragile or unstable for, for other reasons, we're um, stabilizing them to prevent further deterioration post-excavation. Um, and part of uh, what we're doing is uh, restoration or joining for the purposes specifically of study uh, and understanding what the objects are. So, um, obviously we deal with lots of different materials. We deal with uh, metals, bronze, copper alloys, uh, iron, sometimes precious metals. Um, obviously we deal with lots of pottery, uh, wall painting, boxes of wall painting here. Um, also stone, marble. Um, so over here in the corner is our uh, Phoenix laser. We use that uh, mainly right now for uh, cleaning burial accretions off of break edges of marble fragments um, that we're joining back together so we can get nice tight joins. Um, that's been a really nice recent addition to the lab. Um, we have uh, Suheyla Simchimchak over here. She's a student at Elkhar University in Conservation. And uh, she's cleaning some metals under the microscope, which is really important uh, for us to have uh, out here. And I'm, I should say, I'm Brian Kestruda. I'm one of the supervising conservators that works here. And then across the way here is uh, Amia Grant. She's a, a third year student at NYU Institute of Fine Arts and Conservation. Um, and she's working on a, a sieve uh, that was excavated a few years ago. Even though we are in the field, we are treating these objects as if we would in a museum or research context. We're treating them um, following the AIC Conservation Code of Ethics and Guidelines. We do have to take different um, avenues um, in, in regards to each object. We need to think critically about storage, about the treatment protocols. We have to provide a stable lifetime for these objects, and that may differ from what we will find in a museum context due to the extreme conditions faced out here. And so, in each step in the treatment of these objects, we are stabilizing, thinking of their later lifetimes, and this works with this object in front of me as we will put this in an Escal enclosure um, after it's stabilized, um, joined, and um, ready for um, its journey out into the depot. And I would say in the end, being here, I have learned really to um, think critically about what the object needs, whether um, certain treatment steps are, are absolutely um, needed for um, the object and um, how even with slight changes um, in your typical treatment protocol you can provide a stable, a uh, long, stable, happy life for the object in the end. And that's all.
So this is um, some wall painting that we uncovered in Francis' Trench this season. And um, obviously on this wall, we can't really see much of the painting because it's really, really accreted. We have all that just uh, accretion on the surface. Um, but there's some areas where we can see that it has painted it. Um, so for this reason, we are edging it and stabilizing it so that uh, in the future, if we're able to clean this accretion off, we will also still have all of this wall painting still attached to the wall. So what Suvinch and Sahil are doing right now is um, filling some of the, the holes in the wall painting uh, with uh, a lime mortar, which is just lime putty, uh, sand, um, and a little brick dust to act as a kind of a hydraulic pozzolano. And so they're filling the holes here and then they'll also uh, edge the, um, the edge of the wall painting um, just to stabilize it and keep it on the wall. Uh, that is yeah, actually and, you know, very clean, and, um, not, not so accreted as the other wall. You can see lots of beautiful uh, decoration. So this is a bit that we, uh, we edged uh, earlier in the season. Um, so it's, it was, it was crumbling off the wall when we first exposed it, but um, now it's, now it's pretty stable. Where did this, this fault?